Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bob Klein. I'm here today with John Little as part of the INFORM's History of Operations Research Project and also the MIT 150 Infinite History Project. John is an institute professor and a pioneer in the application of operations research to business and particularly to marketing. I've known John since the mid-1960s, first as a student, then teaching assistant, then business colleague. I've had my own company, Applied Marketing Science, for over 25 years, and I once said that everything I needed to know about learning, running a company, I learned from John Little. Now, a lot's been written about John's many accomplishments, and our intention this afternoon is not so much to repeat what has already been said or written, though there will be some of that, but rather to add John's personal style and voice to what exists in other media. So to start out, John, um, tell us where you were born and, and where did you grow up? I was born in Boston on February 1st, 1928. And, but I grew up in Andover, actually the West Parish part of Andover, which is sort of ex-urban at, uh -huh. at that time. And uh, my father compute, commuted to Boston on the train, um, and I sometimes went with him. Uh -huh. um, but to add a little of, to the written record, uh -huh. uh, I grew up in the Depression. Right. And um, my father was uh, a bond salesman. He had been, uh, he was actually always a writer. He, he uh, worked for a while for the Boston Herald as a reporter and then a rewrite man. And, but he switched to the securities business and became a bond salesman but he was out of a job in 1933. They were jumping out of the windows in Wall Street in yeah. 1929, so, and, and I was five years old. Okay. Now, uh, he eventually got, got another job, but in 1933, I started at something called the Pike School. Mrs. Pike, uh, had started a sc school in Shawshine, Shawshine Village, um, and she had a couple of grades there, and I started in first grade in 1933. And the way th things worked then, my father had chickens, and he paid for the tuition <laughs> with eggs <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I don't know anybody else like that but I'm sure there are many. <laughs> um, and after two grades though I, I uh, and, and, and I also started early. I started at five. There were no kindergartens then. Uh, so I started early and I maintained that relative youth throughout mm -hmm. my career. Okay. Um, but then I went to the um, Andover Public Schools, and I went through mm -hmm. the ninth grade. But I was good uh, in school. I mean, I did everything well but penmanship. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and so. Um, my uh, father decided that I could get a scholarship at, uh, at Phillips Academy, which is in Andover. And so after the ninth grade, I went there, uh, and I heard my father say, you know, astonishing things uh, <laughs> about my... my <laughs> IQ and other things, <laughs> which I had taken a test. So at Andover, I um, continued 
to be good in um, in si mathematics and the sciences, mm. uh, and I, I remember my mother's asking me how things were going. I, I, I was a day student, first of all, and I rode my bicycle to school sometimes, and then sometimes I had a lift from an, uh, another person mm -hmm. who was a day student. And my mother asked me, how are things are going? And I said, fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then one day, they had an awards ceremony and I won all kinds of prizes in mathematics and even one in German, which I didn't, th <laughs> didn't think I deserved. <laughs> but, but math and physics were I I easy for me. Um, and so it, I, I, I came to uh, graduate and um, so I asked advice from my, um, I don't know, I think it was my physics teacher or math teacher, of, of where to go. And he said, <laughs> he said, go to MIT. Okay. <laughs> Do you remember if you applied anywhere else or, or no. was it just sort of automatic? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. And, and I got a scholarship, uh, which f <laughs> was uh, uh, essentially for, uh, and it was a, m a remarkable scholarship. It, it paid uh, tuition, which was, I think, $300 a term, <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and an extra uh, bonus. Uh, and it was, um, um, it was a preference would go to Protestant white students from Brookline. Now I wasn't from Brookline, <laughs> but they <laughs> did. Yes. And and so I went to MIT. Um, and and was MIT, majoring in physics sort of automatic, or no? I I looked through the catalog. Uh, which was a big, thick thing then, mm. online now. And I wanted to take all the courses. Okay. <laughs> but I finally decided on physics as being something fundamental, and you could go mm. places from there. Uh, and so I took classes. Um, and my grades started very high. I, I had the, the f first two terms, I had all A's. They were called H's at MIT at that time, but anyway. But two essentially B's, uh, well, uh, one each term in, in mechanical drawing. Oh, thank so, <laughs> My penmanship is slipping. So, so from that start, I went s slowly downhill. <laughs> <laughs> and, <clears throat> and I became uh, the editor of Voodoo. Voodoo is the MIT humor magazine. And uh, I was stunned when I uh, <laughs> heard that, not, not from your lack of sense of humor, but <laughs> just that I had never pictured you in that kind of a role. Well, I have a few pictures. <laughs> um, uh, and the other thing that, that I would mention about MIT was that I, I had a minor in hitchhiking to Wellesley. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and as it turns out, I, I, I married a, a Wellesley graduate, but not the, <laughs> not the one I was dating at oh, the okay, time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but the easiest hitchhiking I ever had was 
when I was dressed up in a tuxedo and I had a box of flowers in my hand. Uh -huh. <laughs> Got a ride like that. Always works. And, and so after MIT? Oh, after MIT, okay. Well, I told you it went steadily downhill. I started in the summer. World War II was still on. And it was 1945. And the MIT was on a schedule, a wartime schedule, which was terms, three terms a year. And I was designated as 248, although I ended up graduating. I took a summer, I spent a summer in Texas. Um, on a seismograph crew, um, uh, but I ended up graduating in August 48. But the last summer, uh, I got the first B I had ever gotten in a math course, <laughs> and that shook me up. I wasn't doing the homework very well, but anyway. And then I t also took a physics course, and I did exactly one problem during the whole course. And MIT is, you know, um, problem sets every week. And I did it, and it was, I, I spent 25 pages on it and passed it in. And I got back a kind of a question mark. <laughs> so I flunked that course. <laughs> so how do I accomplish this? Well, I was mostly sitting on the esplanade <laughs> listening to the concerts, okay. <laughs> lying on my back. And so at the end of that, uh, and I but I did graduate. Um, uh, with a so-so cue. I mean, well, no, a pretty good cue. So I decided that uh, going further in school would be a mistake. <laughs> and so I decided to hitchhike around the country. And hitchhiking was more common in, in those yeah. days. Um, it's considered too dangerous now, but I don't think it's that different. <laughs> I don't think so either. <laughs> and it was just as dangerous then. Yeah. It was just as dangerous then, <laughs> right. <laughs> and I started across the top of the country, and I stopped, and my father was working in Buffalo, but I, I, I I had a friend of mine from my freshman year who said, you'll never make the West Coast. So I was determined to make the West Coast. <laughs> and so I went atop the, uh, across the top of the country, and we don't have the super highways no. then, and um, th through Montana, and, um, Billings, Montana, and I would stay at Wise um, and uh, and inexpensive hotels is what I would do. And I remember Billings, Montana, and Missoula, wonderful towns, um, and on into Washington State. And, and in Washington State, I was picked up um, by a, 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 a truck, a farm truck, and his, he said, kid, do you want a job for a while? And I said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I worked on a sheep ranch, and, <laughs> and that was very interesting. The people were very interesting. Yeah, I bet. Uh, they, lived outdoor, there was, there, there was one guy who had been in a forest fire, and, and, and so his, one side of his face was completely scarred. And there was another who was so quiet, he, he, I mean, he, he spoke in a whisper <laughs> as, we, as we ate. So that was good, and I earned, earned some money, and 
but I was still wanted to get to the West Coast. And so I went on to probably Portland, uh, or I, I went on to Washington and, and down, down, the, down the coast, the mm -hmm. Cascades. And I, I remember uh, hitchhiking into San Francisco, and I got a ride with um, some con men. Now, w w the, there was a chief con man <laughs> who had <laughs> been taught by somebody else. And what he had was two apprentices. Okay. And they were going to San Francisco and stay at a first class hotel and exit without paying the bill. <laughs> okay. So we rode down, and I, I left them, and I have no idea what happened. Okay. I had stayed at the Embarcadero YMCA, which I assure you, which was a big room and with cots in it. And the next to me was a, uh, a sailor. And while he was asleep, he put his wallet in the pillowcase. And while he was asleep, somebody had slit the pillowcase and taken his wallet. Mm. That's the embarcadero yeah. water. Okay. And it's, it's long since torn down. And I also went to the symphony. Um, uh, courtesy of, uh, of a friend of my mother's and was asked about the symphony and I said it was fine. Um, but then I went to LA stopping uh, with people I knew along the way and then I decided I'd go home for Christmas. So I hitchhiked Route 66. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I have hitchhiked old Route 66, uh, and uh, there's a song about that, um, and it. Uh, I, I I remember this something about um, Flagstaff, Arizona. I was frozen to death in front <laughs> of it. It was windy <laughs> and. Wintery, so I went home, and then I went down. Then after Christmas, I decided I'd go to Florida, so I went down to Florida, and uh, and it turns out that everybody else was there too. All the <laughs> hitchhikers <laughs> and hobos <laughs> were there, and um, so I decided to go to. Um, visit my six sister and brother-in-law who were in Austin, Texas. And on the way out of town, <laughs> I rolled over in a car. I was driving. Oh, okay. <laughs> and a salesman, and frequently the, the drivers are salesmen uh, hitchhiking. And, um, so, and I was driving, and he said, we can continue on, and I said, fine. Um, and so I was driving, and uh, up ahead, a car, it's actually, it was a new car, and its right rear wheel skidded off the road, and he lost control of it, and it came across and swiped our bumper and he went backwards into the ditch and we rolled over I remember thinking uh, I'm I'm okay and I said but it isn't over and we rolled over and came up on the wheels okay. and the state police came by <laughs> 
And I give them a lot of credit. They, f they figured out exactly what ha happened. And after that, my salesman remembered it exactly. Okay. <laughs> so um, there were adventures. Yeah. <laughs> there were other adventures. But then you went to work. But then I went to work. Um, and I went to work at GE in Schenectady. And I had interviewed there uh, when I was a senior in college. And, and they'd offered me a job, but I decided to go hitchhiking. And, and I told them I'd been hitchhiking, and they were <laughs> extremely pleased <laughs> that I'd made it back, oh, yeah. I guess. So they gave me a job. And I joined what was known as the physics program. Um, and uh, which is rotating assignments uh, in various locations. I was at the low temperature lab um, and at the tube division. And, uh, and I met my wife-to-be because she was a graduate of, of Wellesley, but I hadn't known her there and was in the physics program, uh, which, which was striving t t to um, get another talent pool besides electrical engineers. Were there very many women in the programs, science um, programs at that time? There were two in the, f in, in the physics huh. program. Um, this physics program of GE. Out um, of how many? Uh, well, uh, out of um, maybe 20. Oh, okay. Anyway, so she and I both uh, pseudo-independently decided to go back to graduate school. And, <clears throat> uh, and so we interviewed uh, and, and filled out forms uh, and interviewed in some places. Uh, and we were interviewed together usually. Um, and I remember the form for the University of Chicago. It was so long, I refused to fill it out. <laughs> <laughs> I think she was admitted to there. But she was admitted to a lot of places. And I was admitted to MIT. And I asked uh, my initial registration officer, I said, what about those, <laughs> those things, I, uh, courses I flunked? And he said, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I guess you're admitted, you're admitted. <laughs> 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 well, forget about that. <laughs> so I was still restless. Um, and I had a friend uh, named uh, Fernando Corbato, and I lived in the what was then uh, the graduate house that later became Ashdown and now is Messi House, uh, and it's at the corner of Mass Avenue and mm -hmm. uh, Moyle Drive. But after a while, we decided that um, it would be good to. Um, to get an apartment. So we got an apartment over on Beacon Hill. And it was on Myrtle Street. And it was $40 a month, rent control. Okay. And that was pretty expensive as far as we were concerned. But <laughs> it had been occupied by an elderly couple and a dog. And the place was an awful mess. So with elbow grease and what have you, we, we painted it up mm -hmm. and we became the inhabitants. And I was still dating um, uh, the same woman, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Alden. Um, and um, and eventually uh, we got married and um, 
and moved to Marlborough Street in a fifth floor walk up. And I had uh, a bicycle. Uh, it was a World War II victory bicycle mm -hmm. with one speed. <laughs> <laughs> but it was okay, and uh, I used to c commute. Now, meanwhile, I was uh, still restless, and and I I passed my general exams in physics, and my uh, the registration, the graduate registration officer was Philip Morse, who was a World War II operations researcher, mm -hmm. and. Um, and, the, and there's a uh, book by Morrison Kimball, uh, which is a collection of World War II declassified uh, examples. And uh, it's called Methods of Operations Research. So um, I was looking around for a thesis topic, no, and, and also I had, t had taken, I, 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 I was kind of r r restless, uh, and I'd taken a, um, a, a um, TA or, or an RA w w uh, with JCR Licklider, who was actually a p fairly a well-known psychologist, mm. uh, and he was great, um, but I didn't want to go into psychology. <laughs> um, uh, but I made some movies with him where I advanced little objects <laughs> on a felt black board. And, um, it uh, uh, and 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 in such that a series of stills turned into a movie. Yes. Anyway, so <clears throat> Morse said, um, "Would you be interested in an operations research thesis?" Uh, meanwhile, as a matter of fact, I was uh, uh, I had an RA in machine methods of computation, which Morse had. And that was supporting me. And, and in, as part of this um, RA, uh, I, Corby and I um, uh, computed a table of spheroidal wave functions. OK. Um, well, I, I, I have to, well, I, Let's, they were esoteric functions. Yes. <laughs> and these were only the coefficients <laughs> for an, exp an expansion in, in, in spherical Bessel functions. But anyway, so we did it. But we did it on Whirlwind. Now, Whirlwind was a digital computer which I learned to use, and Corby learned to use, and he later on became a, essentially a well-known professor of, of computer science. And then uh, I heard about a project that, that was out of the uh, EE department, um, and it it had to do with um, hydroelectric systems and 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 the Bonneville Power Administration, and and they wanted some research done on and and Morse wisely felt that that could be an interesting thesis. Um, but he would keep me on his payroll <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because he didn't trust the engineering department. <laughs> um, 
Exactly. Uh, so that's how um, I, I did my thesis. Uh, and w what I did was I, I came in, uh, I more saw me weekly. Uh, and for maybe a half an hour. And I sat on an uncomfortable couch, which I'm sure he sat people that he wanted to get rid of. But he sat over near the window, and he had a tiny postage stamp of a blackboard, which you couldn't get any equations <laughs> written on. And I, ever since then, I've had a big, big blackboard or a whiteboard. More suggested I work on uh, work out an example and so I sat down to work out an example and then I had an idea and I, I remember crossing Killian Court it was then Great Court mm -hmm. and saying I've got it I know how to do it <laughs> because the, the the basic problem is and here's Grand Coulee right. Dam, yeah. and and you can see the waters rushing over it, and and that is wasting energy for the Bonneville Power Administration. And what it means is that the water is not going through the turbines. So this is the basically the 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 spring runoff season when it looks beautiful and tourist attraction. Uh, now in the fall, the snow falls in the mountains, uh, uh, the rainfall, the, the precipitation is, is in the mountains and it, and it falls as snow. Um, and the stream flow goes very, very low. But there is stream flow, and it's a, a lot of variation. And we had records for, you know, 50, 60 years. And, and, and the problem is that you, you have a, a big reservoir of water, which is really latent energy. However, if you start drawing down the reservoir because the stream flow is low, uh, you drop the head. And head is water times a stream flow plus any d discharge y you elect to take. Um, uh, that's the energy. And so you, you, you want to draw down the r reservoir but you, um, you don't want to get it all done because um, uh, then you have very low head. However, you want to get it done before the stream flow, uh, the, the next flood comes right. in. So that was it. And, and as, I was, as I was walking across the great court, um, I said, I've got it. I know how to formula it. <clears throat> so I went back and wrote it down. And, and I told Morris about it. And, or, and I started using it. I started uh, programming it. And I, I told Morris about it. And he said, um, is, is this the way you want to do it? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. And I said, yes. <laughs> he said, okay. So, um, so I, and, and it, it was, uh, actually I'd reinvented dynamic programming, oh. which Richard Bellman had, was then at Rand writing about it. And, I told Morse about that because a, a paper appeared in, in the journal Operations Research. And 
I told Morse about it, and he said, well, we better finish it and publish it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let me tell you about Whirlwind. That's the object of my affections, uh, the um, Grand Coulee Dam. Yeah. And here is a picture carefully posed uh -huh. of the control room for Whirlwind. And I describe it as my personal computer, 1952-54. Actually, the purpose of Whirlwind was for air defense. Uh, of, uh, it was a prototype uh, computer for air defense. And so uh, the, the work during the day was, uh, was, was totally classified. But in, in the evenings, <laughs> Corby and I yeah. <laughs> had it, well, not to ourselves, but there were some other people too. But, but I call it my personal uh, computer. And this is a picture of what I call the motherboard, mm -hmm. whirlwind motherboard and CPU, right. 1952. It's huge. That's right, it's huge. And you, you can see all the people out posing out here. And th that person is Jay Forrester's, Forrester. And uh, I didn't know him at the time. I now, now know him at the Sloan School, but where, where he's changed careers. But, but he was in charge. Uh, and uh, he has the patents on some... Core memory. Uh, core memory, yeah. right. And this picture is the output. We had a, uh, or Whirlwind had a, uh, um, a, a camera um, which took photographs uh, on command. And this picture shows the top graph is, is stream flow, which you see uh, is off scale at either end mm -hmm. because of the runoff. And then, then it goes down and, and is to low level and, and then starts picking up again. Okay, now my algorithm, uh, my algorithm is, is working here and, and this is uh, a, 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 essentially what you would have to pay um, a, a power company, uh, a steam-driven power company. Uh, this is the a number of kilowatt hours you would, ha you would have to pay them. And, and this is the height of the reservoir. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can see it, it dips down um, in the fall and winter and then uh, rises rapidly in, in the spring. Mm -hmm. And I also want to point out um, uh, the clock, mm -hmm. <laughs> the, 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 which is photographed by the, by the computer. And the date is September 18th, 1954, and it's a.m. So <laughs> I'm in the last stages of my thesis then, and it's six minutes of seven. <laughs> so. So that, so that, was, uh, uh, that was your thesis, and then. That's right. And you graduated with a degree in operations research. Well, I've always, uh, I've, oh, well, I did my uh, general exams in, in physics. There weren't any OR courses. There was one by George Wadsworth in the math department, but, uh, which would, I took, you know, but by and large, there weren't any courses. I took part, courses in partial differential equations and mm -hmm. <laughs> other interesting stuff. Um, as part of my physics uh, training, but 
I generally list my thesis as physics and operations research. As, uh, mm -hmm. and, and given enough space, I will say that I passed my general exams and I did wrote my thesis in operations research. And then from there, okay, a little yeah. time in the army. Yeah. Well, at that time, what I was facing, I mean, I, I, I'm just missed World War II. So I had a draft liability until I was 35. And when you're 25, 35 looks like infinity. <laughs> So I said, I'll get my service out of the way. And so I let myself get drafted. Mm -hmm. And um, Betty stayed with my mother in Andover for a while. And, uh, uh, and I went drafted. I did uh, basic training at Fort Dix, New Jersey. Um, and then the, the ar Army had decided to not be as, as stupid as in World War II. And so I uh, got a special assignment, which was doing military operations research at uh, Fort Monroe, Virginia. And I was working with uh, field grade officers who were uh, very nice, and, and we <laughs> ignored the ranks <laughs> because I had a PhD and they right. didn't. <laughs> but, and, and there were some civilians also with PhDs. <clears throat> and except that I um, was called out uh, every now and then to do KP. <laughs> why um, everything went uh, smoothly. And I bought a boat, uh, uh, Betty and I scraped up our uh, worldly fortune, which was $900, and um, bought a boat uh, which was considerably bigger than a lot of the officers' boats. And uh, but it was a sailboat, and 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 not many of, the, of them had sailboats. So we got in and out of trouble all over um, Chesapeake Bay, uh, and had a great time. And uh, okay, um, and I have pictures. I named the boat Queequeg. We Queequeg is is a. A, a, a very <clears throat> is a very positive character in Moby Dick. So, um, and then we had our first child, which was Jack, John N. Little, who will reappear later. <laughs> so then we took a job in at Case Institute of Technology mm -hmm. in Cleveland. And that was actually a, a pretty productive time. Um, um, and the way it, the, the, the way it worked was that, um, Russ Acoff, there was Acoff, Ch Churchman, and Arnoff, who uh, have an early book on mm -hmm. uh, operations research. But Russ Acoff was the salesman, and he used to sell projects to various and sundry people. Um, and uh, and uh, s s some of them were in marketing, 
I mean, a, a lot of them were in marketing. And, and that got me um, exposed. We had a project with M&M's Candies. Mm -hmm. And I've had dinner at the uh, dining, in the dining room of the Hackettstown Inn with uh, Forrest Mars, uh -huh. who is, who eventually got control from his sister and uh, was for a while the owner of, uh, of Mars and M&M's uh, candies. And I think it's still a private corporation yeah. uh, and, and, and extremely rich. Yeah. And ex Extremely successful, but the the way that that the plant was organized was everybody was in a big room. I mean, the desks were stationed so you you know you could get in between them. <laughs> um, but the problems were interesting. They were a very gutsy company. Uh, and, and, and very experimental. F for example, um, and, and we were cons consulting for them and, and, and analyzing their data. And, and I f first learned uh, what a promotion was from their s sales data. It's actually shipments, mm -hmm. but they had these huge peaks in it, huge peaks in them. And I said, that's not a Poisson process. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, oh no, that's right. That's, that, that's, um, those are promotions. And, and, and we run a promotion and the trade stocks up on it and it, it big peaks. So, um, we did, we analyzed some of their data and, and they decided uh, with s some prodding, uh, with, with some suggestions from us to run an experiment. So they took maybe a third of the country. I mean, they weren't ch right. cheap and, yeah. and, and they stopped advertising. I also learned about advertising mm -hmm. uh, um, agencies and their reps. Um, and so, uh, and, and so nothing happened. And they waited a few months. And it started to go down. And they waited a Another, another three months, and it started to go down rather abruptly. They said, okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll start advertising again. And mostly it was spot advertising. Mm -hmm. And we analyzed this um, um, to build a kind of a response curve, and we presented our results. And there was one feisty member, a, a graduate student, who converted th this marginal analysis into a, um, what do you call the rule curve, which was a, 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 a graphical way to reward the agency um, on, on a marginal cost basis um, for finding lower cost spots. Mm -hmm. And the agency was up in arms. <laughs> And, and I think they probably correctly, um, but they they never M and M's never implement, uh, implemented that. But anyway, uh, there was another um, project with um, Standard Oil of Indiana, mm -hmm. uh, and it was on gas stations. Um, and the, the, an executive at Standard Oil in the Indiana said of Russ Acoff, I'm not sure what he's selling, but I want to buy some of it. Okay. <laughs> so that's why we had the project. Yeah. 
and Russ was like that. I mean, <laughs> very controversial guy. But so uh, that was really your your uh, introduction to marketing. That's and right. Operations research and marketing. That's right. And I had a course, operations research and marketing. It was based on these things and little problems I made up. Um, and we had Cummins Engine, which was another one of them. Um, also, while I was at Case, I wrote a paper which has become Little's Law. And, I'll, and I'll, I'll give you the title of the paper. Mm. Um, well, I've got it here. A proof of the queuing formula L <laughs> equals lambda W. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> It's, I know it as little 1961. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, this, uh, well, when I first came to Case, uh, uh, Russ said, little year from MIT, how about a course on queuing? Okay. Well, I was at MIT, yes, but I had my nose in the <laughs> hydro systems. <laughs> <laughs> not queuing, but that's okay. Uh, I'm, I'm game to learn. And uh, and Morse did a lot with queuing, um, and he he wrote a book called Queues, Inventories, and Main Maintenance while I was there at Case. And I s started using that as a text. And this formula. Um, is was widely known at the time. Uh, however, it was known in specific cases, you know, um, Poisson arrivals and exponential service, for example, mm -hmm. uh, standard case of beautiful, simple uh, mathematics. So, um, as I, as I was teaching the, the course, um, I was kind of challenged by a, a student, uh, Sid Hess, who uh, actually was a chem engineering graduate of MIT. And I was telling people that the, 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 the the formula was much more general, and uh, and I had a heuristic argument w with pictures of you know things cues, um, and so and the, and the class understood my argument. And they said, well, how hard, well, Sid asked, how hard uh, would it be to prove it formally? And I said, well, it shouldn't be too difficult. Um, famous last words. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, you should do it. <laughs> All right. Um, so anyway, I bought some books and I took them to Nantucket, where we 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 spent the summer and the, and I worked on it there. Um, and eventually, I wrote it up and I sent it off, and it was published. All right. So what I thought at that point, um, and, and and the 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 way I went about publishing it, thinking about it, was you need something more general. And so I bought math books. Mm -hmm. I bought a bunch of math books and, and learned a bunch of mathematics and, and, and worked out a proof. But I said, I don't want to be a mathematician. I want to be uh, an OR person. And so I want to um, I'm, I'm not going to do any more of this. So I forgot about it. <laughs> <laughs> but 
for 40 years. <laughs> but then came back. And, but that's a, 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 it's a really different story. Yeah. So, so after Case, then uh, you then I'm came back, back to MIT. Yeah, back to MIT. Um, oh, uh, one other thing I did at Case was I had a, 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 a student who came to me with a pr proposal to s solve a, 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 tr a traffic signal problem. And uh, and he had data from Waltham, Mass or ge the geometries of Waltham, Massachusetts. <laughs> I don't know where he got them. But we published that, <clears throat> and, and that, was a, that was a pretty good paper. Um, then, uh, okay, it's back to MIT. And uh, at MIT, I continued that uh, line of work um, and um, generalized uh, the problem of synchronizing uh, uh, traffic signals to a, a grid. And that was that. But I also um, published, while I was at MIT, um, a paper on the traveling salesman problem, which, which has um, uh, um, a particular contribution by me. Uh, this had started at Case 2 um, with a, a a student named Kata Murti, and uh, he had a tree method, and he was solving the, the, the trees by assignment problems. And, and we ended up with multiple authors, that, but the, the, the last author was a Sloan Fellow at MIT um, who I said we'd like to do some calculations with this. And um, so he was from IBM and, and so he had access to c computers and, and I, th I, th I think we did use the I IBM at MIT. But he was willing to do the programming and he suggested a new idea um, and well I, 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 I let me interrupt and, and <laughs> give you my contribution, which is lingual okay. <laughs> um, I, I understood everything it's 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 actually pretty simple. Uh, and what you do I is um, you form you have a tree. You can represent the the ver various uh, alternatives as a tree. Uh, and the traveling salesman problem is how to go uh, to. Uh, a bunch of cities and have the shortest path, mm -hmm. the shortest connected path. And there have been examples where people had wor worked them out, mm -hmm. you know, laboriously by hand, uh, spe special arguments. But we were Katamurti and um, and and uh, and I and. Uh, Dora Sweeney, uh, the IBM guy, um, were, were looking at this tree. And what I needed was a way of describing what we were trying to, what we were doing. And I remember going up. <laughs> Uh, and, and, I, and I finally had 
a way to describe it. And I remember <laughs> going up and telling my wife <laughs> that I had it. <laughs> and it was branch and bound. So what you have is a tree with, uh, you know, a, a node at the top, and you go down, down, and you go down, and you, you, you have these nodes, and, and, you, and you have, I don't know, looks like a tree. Uh, and, and what you do is at each node, you're going to select a branch to go on. And the way you do it is you calculate a, um, a lower bound on what you can find on that branch. Mm -hmm. And each sub-problem, as uh, Katamorti was doing assignment problems, but what uh, Dura Sweeney uh, observed was they were traveling salesman problems, which gave a tremendous symmetry to the whole algorithm. Mm -hmm. So at each bound, we set up a new traveling salesman problem and, uh, uh, at, at each node, and, and we found a bound on uh, the most you could hope to get out of, of that direction. Mm -hmm. And that's the way we solved it. And as I used to say, we set the indoor record <laughs> <laughs> for size of, we, we drew matrices at random. Um, uh, and we had the indoor record, which, mm -hmm. which was 40. Right. So anyway, but, yeah. but, but, but branch and bound has been picked up and is throughout the literature. Uh, as as how you approach these problems, okay. and it's it's also um, it, it, there are variants that branch and do something else. Okay. Uh, with a lot of detours into traveling salesmen and, and stuff, you really got involved in marketing and full time then in the uh, in the mid sixties. Right. Right. Um, and um, and that's when I think. Uh, well, what 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 year is your master's degree? Mine was uh, sixty-eight. Sixty-eight. Yeah. Well, we had the marketing game. Right. <laughs> and you were my TA for the right. marketing game. Right. Um, but I was uh, was really in marketing and and a, um, and. We had an, an, a new marketing group with Glenn Urban. Uh, we had Arnie Amstutz for, for, for a while, mm -hmm. uh, and he, a very creative guy. Um, but, but also a creative businessman. <laughs> yes. Um, and we had Al Silk. Uh, and later Rick Bogosi, and um, we, we, we had a, a lot of good people. But, uh, uh, and, and then uh, a, a student that turned up at the OR Center, and I was technically a supervisor, and that was John Hauser. And he was uh, turned on by uh, by a paper we'll 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 get to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but pr prior to that, I had a, a student uh, in the Sloan School, uh, Leonard Lodish, who had an undergraduate degree from. Kenyan, I think, um, uh, in mathematics. But uh, he was interested in OR, but 
he, he tells me that he, he went around to Miriam Sherman, who was an administrative woman mm -hmm. who glued the, <laughs> glued the school together. Yeah. <laughs> and, and she recommended uh, that why don't you uh, uh, lend, uh, asked her advice, and she said, why don't you go talk to John Little about marketing? So he came, and he found me working on a media problem. <laughs> and we did a, uh, we co-published a uh, simple model in, um, uh, in this industrial management review. So then uh, I started working on Mediac, and which is a, a, a careful uh, analysis of the media problem with definition of terms and um, models which viewed advertising as a, a, a essentially a, a, a uh, exposure as a, a little jump uh, in your perception and then a slow decay. And uh, we, we formulated that and eventually published it in, uh, in operations research and in a and we had data and, you know, all good things. And Were you working with any agencies at the time, or was it...? Um, I think not. I think not. Um, but uh, Len wanted to form a company, mm -hmm. and he was influenced <coughs> in this by Arnold Amstutz, who was always following <laughs> forming companies. <laughs> And so um, I said, well, we uh, have to do some market research. And so I reached around behind me and got out the Boston Yellow Pages mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and looked for ad agencies. And there were many, many ad agencies. And I said, that does it. Let's form a company. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Um, but Len was a lot of the stimulus, and he sold um, the, the first uh, project, and, and it was to a uh, a uh, a company in Providence, uh, which I don't re recall the name, and so we formed a company and he put in $500 and I put in $500 and we incorporated. Uh, then, uh, and uh, uh, my then secretary, uh, Betsy Wood, um, went to work at Young and Rubicam, and her boss at Young, he t he, she told her boss uh, in, in New York uh, uh, about our company and our uh, uh, computerization of the, the media selection pro mm -hmm. process. I mean, which has never been, s well, uh, there's, there, there's stuff in the literature, but not very much. And it's not, um, m most of it is not real life. So uh, we were eager to use it. And so we wrote a c contract with Telmar, which was hideous in retrospect. <laughs> we were so afraid. <laughs> we were giving something away we shouldn't. 
but but it, it all worked out because <laughs> everybody was good friends. Um, and they started, uh, and uh, and the, the the gentleman at Young and Rupkam was named Stan Fetterman, and so Lynn and uh, Betsy Wood and uh, Stan were the major uh, show, and they added other people, mm -hmm. and they went. And Stan went out and sold it, and um, I remember uh, go, going to New York, and um, I forget, uh, there, there was a, a, a staunch researcher, a, a well-known advertising researcher, who, uh, a couple of them, who uh, uh, liked our work, and, and, and so they were off and running. Telmar still exists. <laughs> Sam Fetterman is long yeah. since retired, yeah. and, and Len is retired too. Yeah. But. Um, is that the first marketing model that, that you sold? That's right. And, and, but I think that's right. But, but, but Len, uh, and Len yeah. sold it. Yeah. I did the research, yeah. I did the yellow pages. <laughs> But I think putting a name on on a marketing model and then, you know, selling it. That's right. Is that, uh, turning into a product. That's right. That's a product. Right. I don't know how we, what the, uh, how we how we protected it. But later at MDS we, <coughs> oh oh, and the name of the company was Management Decision Systems, right. or MDS. Um, and meanwhile, back at the ranch, um, we hired a couple of programmers, and Glenn Urban was getting in the act, mm -hmm. and we hired a couple of programmers who were MIT undergraduates. And Len began developing models, and and uh, so did Len. Len built, uh, developed a, a product called Call Plan, which was um, helped uh, a salesman plan his uh, calls mm -hmm. and, and route. How many times to call on each? Yeah, that's each right. of their each of his customers. Um, and then we got a project with Nabisco. I don't remember. Oh, well, we we ran summer pro two week summer courses, um, and ex explained what we called OR and marketing or management science and marketing, and we we had. Uh, People come in, and we explained what we were doing. And Glenn would talk about his stuff. I would talk about Mediac and uh, and and adaptive control, which was another model mm -hmm. I developed. And so we were off and running. Um, now. Uh, what but it turned out that that software was part of the um, we hired among other people uh, Bob Klein yeah. <laughs> right. what what was your number I was number two and number full time two. employees a full time employees I, I missed okay. it, missed being number one by a month <laughs> I see who was one Rick Rick, Karsh? Rick was Rick, Karsh. Rick was the first um, these these were got laid off from Data General or from Digital, I think. I see. And uh, <laughs> well, we uh, we hired our students, uh, uh, basically master's students, uh, uh, and Len now had his PhD. 
and uh, we had a we our tool was the computer and our mathematics was was were marketing models mm -hmm. uh, and the principals who were the academics um, and wanted to stay academics felt that what they would like to do was do the first application of the new model and then publish it because we're academics and then uh, turn it over to uh, others which were smart uh, master students and and that worked very well <laughs> the uh, uh, the computer systems that were you know developed and, and where the we had time sharing you right know, and uh, and that was the you know access to computers at that time that's right. Uh, uh, there was a project at MIT called Project Mac, right. um, M A C in capital letters, and um, it stood for multiple access computing and something else. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know what the other thing was, but. But but it essentially was taking a mainframe and and time sharing and and this um, you had to have an operating system and you had to do things um, to make that possible and it was um, I mean it's 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 it still exists in big mainframes but but it's basically uh, supplanted by the personal computer sure. and now the handhelds. These uh, summer programs, is that where the co uh, contacts with Nabisco and Coca-Cola yeah. came from? Right, right, right. So I did a project, as, as a result of this, I did a project with uh, Nabisco and a model building project and 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 also at Coca-Cola. Um, and this was extraordinary good f fortune because um, they are totally different products and distribution right. systems. <laughs> uh, Abisco had um, had cookies and crackers, basically, and plants to manufacture them. Uh, and then salesmen who uh, go into supermarkets and um, set up and, and deliver, deliver the product, in, in that, in, at least in those days. Uh, and Coca-Cola doesn't make any soft drinks. <laughs> <laughs> it only makes syrup, <laughs> and it has a huge distribution system. Well, what that means is that there's nothing at, <laughs> in Atlanta but a big building, <laughs> uh, uh, which uh, supervises the distribution system and they have bottlers out, out in the boondocks and w who are frequently independent operators or or might might not be so uh, it was wonderful and and, and coca-cola was very interested in advertising um, and and things have to having to do with that but but they monitored th their distribution system constantly and they were able to do experiments. How important was it to, to be working with people inside companies like that for, you know, 
both ideas as well as uh, our classroom. Yeah, stuff. well, I've often claimed that uh, if um, my license to go into a classroom and talk about marketing is really based on uh, having uh, the, the MDS firm doing it and being there with brand managers uh, as they made, as they t talked about their problems mm -hmm. uh, and are our models relevant. Um, the Models and Managers paper from 1970, I mean, I remember reading it in, um, in uh, management science, uh, sort of after we talked about um, my coming to work for management <laughs> decision systems, but before it actually happened, because I think it came out in April of uh, 1970, and it was, uh, uh, I was just blown away by the the basic concepts and, and what makes a good model and that that whole yeah the the whole picture. Um, what 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 motivated you to write that article? Well, like many things, <laughs> sort of came together quickly. Uh, uh, although I spent a lot of time working. Uh, various writing it. But let's talk about hit a four. Um, the, the econometricians um, uh, count on having a big database with uh, a lot of observations. But they w work, I mean, uh, and particularly in those days, they, they work with linear models. And <coughs> it's not very hard to see <laughs> that linear models <laughs> don't work. <laughs> For example, in advertising, a linear model of advertising would say, as as a, a a decision tool, you either advertising zero or infinity. Right. <laughs> um, so w we weren't doing that that sort of thing, um, and and we ha had more complicated models. And and finally, I kind of threw away a constraint. And the constraint was that you had to have data for everything. Um, what, what I saw people doing is using their own good judgment. They would stare at the data. <laughs> and make up their mind. And so why not go to them for, for their judgment? So I, I, I started building models which were uh, judgmental. I said, uh, let's, take, uh, let's take advertising. So we now have a, a given level of advertising. Now, what would happen if we had all the advertising we could possibly use? How high would sales go then? Okay, suppose we take our current level and increase it 50 percent, how, how much do you think the, the sales would go up? And also, 
suppose we cut advertising and didn't do it. Um, and uh, how low do you think the uh, sales would go? So asking these questions of, of people, and, and, and there's a lot of data. In other words, they, they know what kind of normal sales are. And they've been fiddling with their advertising. They have a guess uh, at, at how much it would go up. And, 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 and what the limits were. I mean, they're, they're just physical limits. Yeah, I mean, I, rem I remember doing, yeah. r running those, those <laughs> kinds of workshops with a half a dozen that's right. Uh, marketing guys in the room, and you know, and, and the you know people from an ad agency and uh, um, and brand management, and you know, and they would make their estimates, and we'd have them do it separately, and then I would, we would tally up what the what the median turned out to be, and people would argue about it and stuff. But you're right; uh, they they have a an intern they have their own internal models. Yeah, I mean, people have make judgments, and um, you know it's when you make them explicit, then they're they're able to to say, okay, well, if this is what I really believe, then That's right. here's what I ought to do. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And <laughs> um. And and there's and there's data analysis mm -hmm. in the back, but to uh, what I ended up doing was writing a paper, which I think summarized my impressions of what we were doing in the in the field, um, in in various kinds of models. Glenn Glenn had a whole series of models, but. Uh, and he had specific measurements he, he, he did, but that's fine, that fits in. So I wrote a paper called Models and Managers, the Concept of a Decision Calculus, and I, and I called the, uh, the uh, pr product of this uh, a decision calculus. Okay, and, and my first sentence is, of this paper, is, and, and, uh, uh, and this paper developed, uh, let me throw in an aside, this paper developed a, fo a following, and, um, and was uh, deemed one of the Ten most influential papers uh, in management science in the first 50 years, which I felt very flattered about. But the, my first sentence is: the big problem with management science models is that managers practically never use them, <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's not a negative paper. Um, but I, I, I sort of characterized the, um, the, the, the problems, and I suggested characteristics of the model that a model should have, uh, which I felt made it m more ap appealing to managers. And so there's a list of maybe seven, right. and um, and the f a model to be used by a manager should be simple, robust, easy to control, adaptive, as complete as possible, and easy to communicate. By simple, uh, I meant uh, easy to understand. 
by robust hard to get absurd answers from it by easy to control that the user knows what input data would be required to produce desired output mm -hmm. answers. Adaptive means that the model can be adjusted as new information is acquired. Completeness implies that important phenomena will be included even if they require judgmental estimates of their effect. And finally, easy to communicate with means that the manager can quickly and easily change inputs and outputs and uh, uh, change inputs and obtain and understand the outputs. So that summarizes a, a 30 or 40 page paper. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, I've in my career made that kind of required reading for people who work for me. <laughs> I see. That, uh, if, you know, if if we're doing something that the client doesn't understand, they're not going to believe it. <laughs> That's right. And um, so, um, you know, all of those things are, are really critical in any, any marketing model. Um, when, when, when did the term marketing science emerge? I mean, there's the journal marketing science, but before that, there was sort of the concept of marketing science, even though some people would argue that marketing isn't a, isn't a science, or it would have at that, at that time. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me take care of the journal, because I think that Journal reinforced the the, the term. Um, of the two professional societies that that were rather duplicative, and eventually I was involved in their merger. Uh, the Operations Research Society of America, WARSA, and TIMS, the Institute of Management Sciences, uh, did a, a lot cooperatively. And uh, I had traditionally published uh, in Operations Research and uh, have many papers there. Uh, uh, although this models and managers happen to be uh, in um, management science. But of the two societies, uh, at, at one point, as, as there's more and more stuff was coming out in, in what, a, what could be called quantitative marketing and, and measurement, the um, I think I was president of ORSA, right, and uh, Frank Bass of the University of, of Texas um, at Dallas uh, was a president of TIMS. And TIMS had a very st strong uh, group, a, a, a subsection uh, called the, um, the College of, of Marketing. And we were both in it, and they actively had con conferences and, and dealt with marketing issues and models. Uh, so at, at one juncture, um, Frank and I got together and said we should start a new journal. 
for for this stuff, and and I wanted it to be a joint journal, and 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 so did Frank, as far as that goes. So uh, he didn't have any problem with <laughs> Tim's council. I had a little problem with the Orsa problem, uh, Orsa council, uh, which. <laughs> finally said, oh, let John have his journal. <laughs> and we named it uh, Marketing Science. Uh, and, uh, and, and very uh, interesting, the um, Bill Perscala, who was the, the name of the uh, editor of Operations Research at the time, stopped publishing uh, uh, marketing articles, and uh, not so the editor of, of, of Management Science has continued to publish them and had special issues on marketing. Uh, and that, that is, uh, to some extent, true to this day. Uh, both journals are now of the uh, umbrellas of society uh, in forms, but there's much less marketing in, um, in operations research than there is in, in management science. Anyway, uh, so. so I think it, it was going on, it was going on, and both Frank and I were, were publishing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and this paper was one of our products. And it's, it's certainly, uh, uh, and, and the illustration, it, the, the concept is more general, but uh, the illustration is, is, is strictly marketing. Um, and it, it we le we learned a lot in um, Mediac and Brand Aid and uh, applying these mm -hmm. uh, these uh, models in in the world. I, Brand Aid was another. Uh, it was a two part paper. W one some theory, um, and the, and the other uh, an example. Mm -hmm. Basically, was Oreos. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the um, uh, wh what what were some of the lessons that you drew from your sort of management decision systems and the entrepreneurship <laughs> that you showed there? There, there was a, a a session uh, in in Maryland. We had a conference in Maryland and of. Um, and and Bob gave a talk. <laughs> <laughs> and and he, he he's mentioned one of the things. <laughs> well, I think uh, you know, running a company um, uh, forces you to to address a lot of issues that. Uh, <laughs> That's right. That marketing models maybe <laughs> can gloss over. That's right. That's right. <laughs> the, um, but uh, the 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 at MDS we were um, there's a big transition from software to support model models and building models like Brand Aid and Sprinter and Call Plan and so on to um, software for building decision support systems. That's an excellent point. The, um, uh, the term decision support systems, did you coin that as well? or No, no. Um, let's see. No, I won't say Michael Scott Martin. Okay. Point. Right. He he coined management decision system, oh, yeah. <laughs> and then 
he had to have something else. Yeah. Peter Keene, I think, was uh, another faculty member at, at, yeah. at Sloan, and, and, and Michael was uh, uh, in information systems area. But it was descriptive. The, the thing is, uh, I, I like descriptive titles, and a decision support system is, is, is descriptive because it, it implies uh, data and, uh, and software um, and access and actually uh, 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 you get to uh, models and, and, and perhaps it's time for another anecdote. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but we had, we had these um, Uh, these uh, software developers, and th there was w one, uh, and I don't think he ever got a master's degree. Jay Words. Jay? No, I don't think so. No, he never did. No. Uh, well, uh, it was because he was too busy making yeah, right. money. <laughs> but uh, his view of the world was you people think that these models are all different. I think they're all the same. <laughs> and what I would like is some budget <laughs> to implement uh, a, a more general scheme. And I remember uh, sitting in Nantucket where we used to go to uh, our house down there and talking to Jay about uh, software requirements. Uh, and I, I said, you, you have products. You might have, it, but you will likely have multiple products. You have time periods what you might have weeks or months or um, any time period. And then you have geography. You have multiple cities or markets. And you have at least those three things and probably we can think of some more. And, and, and Jay said, you'd like to specify it at runtime. And I said, well, that would be nice. <laughs> and so he, he built it. Um, and he added all sorts of functional capabilities. I mean, you get mul uh, add, multiply, and so forth. But, but, uh, but aids to time series. But, but what, 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 what you had was the ability to give a name to uh, the months. It could be February, March, and April, or, or it could give a name to the markets. It could be New York and uh, Chicago and L.A. And, and uh, uh, and multiple products. And, and it just worked. Mm -hmm. And you could take a bright um, master's degree <laughs> or MBA. It's, now it's an MBA, it wasn't then. But uh, uh, MBA from MIT or Wharton. Uh, and they could, with very little training, uh, operate this thing and set up databases. Uh, uh, and so as a consulting company, we had people doing uh, miracles. <laughs> well, I mean, companies like Nabisco and, and Coke had, had just mountains of data. And if a manager wanted to know 
you know, kind of what what were sales in in Chicago last week? The guy would run off, and a day later would come back with the report, and, and the manager would then say, "Well, is that up or down from last year?" <laughs> and you know, back and forth and back and forth, and and weeks would go by before the manager really got the answer to the to That's the right. question and um, uh, express let. Uh, that was the name of our software, yeah. Express. Let 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 people first get access to this information very quickly, but then also uh, do all sorts of transformations to it to get the answer to the question they were they were really asking. That's uh, right. You can tell the yeah. Coke story. Yeah, I have a Coke story, which I think I I I think that this MBA here is John Reed. Probably. Who has a piece in the Sloan, uh, has a quote in, in the Sloan 100th anniversary book. Uh, and, uh, and he's at a higher level in the company <laughs> than he was then. But he'd been a, so, I will um, scan this and read it. Once upon a time, which is 1973, an MBA student took a summer job with a large food manufacturer, namely Coca-Cola. He reported the management science in the principal division of the company. The MBA was assigned to put key marketing information, basically store audit data, on a time-shared computer, and, and this would be in, in Express. The goal was an easy-to-use retrieval system. Okay, he did this. By the end of the summer, word of the system had reached the marketing manager of the major product of the division, who asked for a demonstration. The MBA and the management scientists showed the marketing management how simple English-like commands could retrieve data items, sales, share, <coughs> price, distribution level, each by brand, package size, and month. Package size is another thing. Brand is another dimension. The marketing management was, manager was impressed. You must be fantastically smart, he said. The people downstairs in MIS um, have been trying to do this for years, and they haven't gotten anywhere. <laughs> this is typical <laughs> of that senior management of that day in, in their MIS departments. So it was hard for the MBA to reject this assessment out of hands, but he did acknowledge, and this is a key point, that the software has changed and high-level analytic languages are available on time sharing and make it easy uh, to bring up such systems. Okay, the MBA and the uh, management scientist flushed with success, and we essentially were dealing with the management scientist, and, and the MBA eventually worked, went to work for Coca-Cola. Uh, I'd like to know, or the marketing, he said, ask us anything. <laughs> Famous <Blessed> last words. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> well, the marketing manager thought a minute and said, I'd like to know how much the competitor's introduction of the 40-ounce package in Los Angeles cut into the sales of our 16-ounce package. Well, the MBA and the management scientists looked at each other in dismay. What they realized right away is, and what you might, uh, with a little thought, is 
there aren't any, there isn't any data in, in the computer about sales that didn't occur. <laughs> <laughs> so this isn't a retrieval que question at all. It's an analysis question. Okay, now the marketing manager had no idea that that, I mean, it was just a fact as far as he was concerned. Uh, and, and, and so why wouldn't it be there? <laughs> now, what you need to answer the question is a model. And in, in, in this case, it's a pretty simple model that you, you could, and, and we sat around and, and at the time and we talked about it. Uh, you could take the market share um, before the competitive introduction and extrapolate it forward and, and assume that that's the baseline mm -hmm. uh, uh, reference point and then calculate uh, how much that uh, uh, share and, and therefore s sales you, you had lost in this time period. And but, but, but the, the miracle of the, of the um, Express software compared to its competition was that of a, 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 a few keys pushed on the keyboard and out came the answer, uh, you know, in share points, uh, in cases and, and ounces. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there are f a few lessons that uh, I drew for this paper, and that is managers ask for analysis, not retrieval, uh, as well as retrieval. Good data is vital. You've got to have it, and it's got to be in there, and it's got to be right. You need models. They're often simple models, but you need them to, to, gi to give the full picture of the market. And you need an intermediary. The, the, the uh, well-trained management s scientist at Koch was uh, s such an intermediary. I mean, I've, I've, I've seen when, uh, <laughs> I think it was also at Koch, when, <laughs> when um, s somebody had a keyboard and had a, program going, uh, asked the, the manager to sit down. Well, he didn't know where the keys were. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it was very quick, very, very quick to um, find a substitute. But another lesson was quick, quick, quick. Um, if you could answer the question when it was asked, uh, essentially immediately, it made all the difference in the world. Right. And, and, and one question leads, leads to another. To another. Uh, right. And, and you're, you're problem solving on the computer. Uh, and, that's, uh, and, and that's because of the, the software. Yeah. And, 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 and we did very well with it. I mean, it's really the online analytic processing, OLAP. Yes, yes, oh, that's right, OLAP. Oh, uh, I had forgotten, uh, I, I was trying to remember the term. But there's also another element. It's the multi-dimensional database, right. which was ignored by uh, MIS for a long time in favor of relational databases. Well, relational databases are great, uh, but but uh, OLAP was essentially the answer. Mm -hmm. Online at it.
analytic processing. Express uh, core of that actually still exists inside of Oracle. Right. And their, we, so, their we, system. Uh, MDS or IRI actually by that time, we, we, MDS was absorbed by uh, IRI Information Resources Inc. in 1985. Uh, but, uh, and later, um, uh, and Express continued to develop, and and, uh, and, uh, and eventually was sold to Oracle for a hundred million dollars. Uh, and Oracle, you know, and, and there are still some some of the old MDS people <laughs> are still there, at, still at Oracle, keeping. Uh, uh, yeah, Phil keep, Johnson. Phil Johnson. Uh, and Phil Johnson. Uh, Andy Goldberg. And, uh, I see. Um, so, um, how about UPC data? Yeah, UPC <laughs> data came along then, uh, and and sort of changed things by an order of magnitude, at least. Right. We last had data. I mean, <clears throat> before that, we had factory shipments. Right. And that's there's all sorts of problems with that. Plus, it's only your data. It's only your data. Yeah, you don't see UPC your data was everybody's data, thanks to, um, well, I guess Nielsen and IRI. UPC stands for Universal Product Code. It's the barcodes on the uh, side of your package. And there, there are a couple of things we did with that. Uh, one, um, uh, Peter Guadagni was a uh, was a master's student of mine at MIT, and um, he's had a summer job with Bob Klein, right. <laughs> and. He's a very smart guy. <clears throat> I had lunch with him <laughs> last week in San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, he, we, we got a hold of some panel data. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know, you can probably tell the story of uh, its acquisition better than I. Well. <laughs> The um, uh, this was the Kansas City yeah. panel data. This was uh, uh, six stores in in Kansas City, where uh, Sammy, which was a division of Time Incorporated, Inc., yeah. and they were uh, collecting warehouse withdrawal data, which was and, and saw the UPC data scanner data as being a step closer to the actual sale of the product than warehouse withdrawals. And so um, they were trying to run a pilot program in Kansas City where people would show a card when they checked out. Now everybody, of course, shows their loyalty cards. <laughs> um, you got a keychain full of them. Um, but they would train, pe people would show these cards and so you would have a complete record of not just what the store sold in a week, but what a household had purchased over a period of time. And um, they took the uh, coffee category and uh, made it available for academic research. And we used it. Yeah. Peter uh, used it in his thesis. Uh, and the underlying technology uh, is um, the so-called logit model, multinomial logit model, uh, also called by the statisticians logistic regression. And it, um, you, the Data tells you the price paid, uh, the the in-store observation 
tells you w what is on display um, and th there are the there are features which appear uh, and with coupons in the uh, Sunday supplements. So um, you you have a number of control variables uh, that potentially influence the customer, and you have the the stream of purchases which the customer made, and and. This is um, um, a now a, f a famous paper um, because Bob Klein got out and got to the data first, <laughs> <laughs> and Peter Peter wrote it up, uh, and and uh, and. Peter and I published it, and it's it's a very heavily cited paper, because uh, everybody saw that, that that this was something that they could do. Uh, I mean, m many other academics and and other databases became available, uh, and and people s saw that. This was a sandbox that they could play in, and they made variations. Uh, b but there's something called the Guadani little loyalty, <laughs> which is very hard to beat <laughs> uh -huh. in terms of um, forecasting ahead. Uh, uh, and and I have uh, have always said I I've never seen you know, multiple regression uh, to anything like this in terms of its ability to forecast. And, and, it, and it exists today and, and people still work over some of these problems and there are new technologies uh, mm. out there to deal with it. But it's all marketing science. Yeah. It's all marketing science. Uh, uh, it's, uh, um, but marketing is a practical s s subject, uh, and, and you're trying to do somebody some good. So, but you n need the underlying uh, behavior in, in order to, to do that. So, um, UPC data was really big data. Um, in, in the 80s, and, and it was an order of magnitude more information than, than we had, well, orders of magnitude more information than we had from just uh, store shipments or store sales uh, alone, because we had it down to the individual family level. Right. And uh, you created a system called Cover Story that helped essentially interpret that data automatically. Right, right. And I, the guinea pig client uh, was uh, Ocean Spray Cranberries, which was an MDS uh, client, and had, um, uh, you know, databases uh, readily available. But what I was trying to do is to write a report about significant uh, events that were occurring in the data and so that somebody didn't have to s sit down and scan everything uh, you know put it on the screen and and and, and inspect it um, and, and that this would be done automatically and with the highlights uh, picked out. And so we had a, um, a bunch of words which are descriptive of the, uh, uh, the, the, the products. 
um, and connecting words like and and is and things. Um, and so we wrote plug-ins sentences um, and uh, it was a huge word perfect <coughs> program by one of the authors of this uh, paper. Uh, and it was, uh, it, it, w it was pretty useful um, and uh, it, it has since been overtaken by natural language programming <laughs> and, other, and other good stuff. Um, but this was um, a, an early, um, early exercises in, in automated uh, analysis, uh, and and uh, was appreciated by the the people mm -hmm. who used it. Right. And it was also <laughs> had the had the complement of. Uh, a competitive company uh, copied it, right. essentially, <laughs> giving it a different yeah. name. <laughs> but that's fine. Yeah. But, uh, but I think it was a, a, an, another s step toward automated analysis. And, and, and you had sort of this year versus last year uh, uh, plots um, automatedly put out for, for particularly for products that had some s significant mm -hmm. changes. Yeah. And, uh, so so you, you mentioned before that MDS was acquired by or merged e into e yes. IRI in, in That's right. the mid 80s. Um, and you know, I know, I know you were uh, involved in a lot of the meetings around the creation of InfoScan Right. Which was the oh yes, right, right, which right, was the right. InfoScan, first giant right. UPC database, you know, with national data. That's right, and uh, and my former student uh, Len Lodish and another former student um, Majid Abraham um, were authors of a uh, a, 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 of, uh, a paper which. Uh, uh, I guess was InfoScan or Promotion Scan, uh, Promotion but, scan it but it was a, a published pa paper right. Right. by uh, two of my former right. doctoral right. students. <laughs> and, and so, uh, which I used to, I, I used to use it, and I, I, for a long time, I taught a marketing models class, uh, and 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 that was a section of it. Yeah. So, so you were, uh, you went from uh, sort of the small company to the big company. IRI was, I think, the fourth largest market research company in the world at the time they uh, uh, right. acquired us. And, uh, right. Well, and then, as I was on the board of directors, right. and and you have board of directors issues, <laughs> things like, how are we doing this quarter? Right. <laughs> Not marketing science. Not marketing science. <laughs> the, uh, so, so, what what have you been doing more recently? Well, I've returned <laughs> to Little Slaw. <laughs> Little Slaw started popping up. Oh, uh, I don't know. Um, maybe. Uh, Fifteen years ago, uh, um, and and by then it was called Little Slaw, <laughs> not Ellie Glus Lambda W. Yeah. Um, and I've had a lot of fun, uh, and and the issue uh, um, um, it's it's been picked up, particularly in operations management. Uh, and uh, I was approached to um, write a chapter, and I said, well, I haven't looked at this for 40 years. <laughs> mm. 
and a chapter in a book. Uh, uh, and I got Steve Graves to help me with uh, the OM. And I think we should come back and do uh, uh, a, 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 a different interview about that. But it continues to go on, and I'm, um, I've organized a s session uh, at the next San Francisco Informs meeting called um, Applications of Little's Law. And um, there are two or three in impressive papers. One of, one of the uh, issues with Little's Law is it applies in so many situations. I mean, uh, cues are everywhere. Right. <laughs> uh, and things you can think of as cues are everywhere, uh, such as production systems and mm -hmm. things like that. Well, and you mentioned once to me the uh, uh, applications of, you know, in, in computer chip design. Oh, yes. Oh, that, oh yes. Uh, well, uh, I have a, 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 a s s uh, if you wish, a, a, a sequel to my 1961 paper. Um, uh, 19, um, uh, 2011, excuse me, 20, uh, 2011 is the 50th anniversary. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so I was uh, asked to, whether I would like to write a paper, uh, a retrospective paper, and I said yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's published in Operations mm -hmm. Research. And there, there are many fields, uh, health management. Uh, uh, there are many cues inside the, compu uh, inside the computer itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so the d computer designers uh, are uh, uh, very interested in, in these issues. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about Betty and your family? It, yes, yes. Just a, a quick. Uh, my my late wife um, Elizabeth A. Little um, was a physicist, and um, and. Uh, as I've mentioned before. Um, and then uh, we've, we've had uh, four children, um, and each of them uh, has been either an engineer or a scientist. <laughs> But I, I wanted to say something about her attitudes because she got a PhD. Uh, uh, she finished slightly before me, but we both graduated as, essentially in in the uh, in 1955 at the graduation then. Um, and. Uh, what I wanted to say was people often come up to me and say, well, it must have been very difficult being a woman in, in, in the early 50s in a PhD program. I disagree. <laughs> Her parents, um, or her father, at least, <laughs> who, was a, uh, who was a very successful uh, Long Island doctor uh, who uh, grew up in Vermont. And, um, and, <laughs> and as was frequently true in that family, uh, his wife uh, asked Betty, um, are you sure it's physics you want? 
And Betty said, yes. <laughs> and went on in physics. Well, I, I mean, we were there together uh, in the phys physics PhD program. Um, she was working very, very hard because some of the courses that I had flunked, she had to pass. Oh, <laughs> But I, no, there was there was there was, there was a physics uh, qualifying exam uh, and and then a general exam, uh, and I mean, uh, I I never heard her complain about mm. about any of these things. She knew what she wanted to do, and was doing it. Mm -hmm. She had plenty of boyfriends. Oh. <laughs> I, I fought them off. <laughs> so that's what I wanted to say because I, I don't think that, that she felt any hardship. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and let me tell you the sequel because she is uh, really interested in research. In, in Nantucket, <coughs> because there's no laboratory or, you know, I was in the Army and things like that, she drifted away from physics. But, um, but sh she became interested in uh, Northeastern Indian archaeology. Uh, of, of which there, uh, there, there are, you know, Nantucket is loaded with this mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, uh, and she published her own series of papers. Uh, and she went and got a master's degree uh, at UMass Amherst under the what I call the reigning queen mm -hmm. of <laughs> uh, at the time of the uh, Indian archaeology, and she knew something about um, well, it, it, uh, there's a lot of stuff done by radiocarbon dating, mm -hmm. dating, and she was totally comfortable with that and reading the papers and writing the papers. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so she has a whole series. Uh, she ha has a a, uh, a, a co-authored paper for me. Uh, we, we tried co-authoring when we were in graduate school. Didn't work. <laughs> Different mentalities. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but we, we finally did a, um, uh, a co-authored paper for the Journal of Archaeological Science. Um, and she came to me one day and she said, isn't, isn't there some way I can process this data? I, I've, I've made radiocarbon dates in all of these specimens and I've, I've done that for the plants. And she used to go out and, and, and collect plants that, the, uh, that are native to the region. And shellfish and things like that. And she says, I, ha I have these readings and I, I, and, and I, and I w want to say something about the diet. I don't have too many readings. And I said, well, um, and, and, and I mean, the diet could be deer, the, the diet could be quahogs, I mean, what have you. Um, and I said, well, uh, you could put, put bounds on these things by linear programming. And she says, well, tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> and so I wrote a linear program in I Express. Okay. <laughs> and I, I, I processed it and, uh, and she made me be lead author. Oh. <laughs> Because she said, if there are any questions about linear programming, she wants somebody oh. <laughs> who can answer them. But but she was a really uh, good researcher. Yeah. 
whatever she touched. touched. And then your kids. I mean, oh, kids. Well. <laughs> Jack is the uh, yeah, founder Jack, and, Jack, of MathWorks. Yeah, and, Jack is the CEO of MathWorks. Impressive right. accomplishment. Well, <laughs> am I he's an undergraduate uh, uh, EE at MIT. And, has a master's degree from Stanford, and uh, uh, and then got into um, systems control issues. Mm -hmm. um, but but then he saw an opportunity in the PC uh, as. Um, as a, as a tool for um, engineering calculations mm -hmm. and systems control, signal processing. So he went out and got a, a, um, um, a top-notch numerical an analyst, Cleve Moeller. Mm -hmm. and, And conce conceived, he was also a good, a good writer. Uh, my my father complimented on his writing of his manuals, but uh, uh, but they went to a system of toolboxes where they let anybody mm. use MATLAB to to create a, a say. Uh, a uh, signal processing toolbox, and so they could easily uh, expand and get more talent for royalties, basically. And it's been very, yeah. very successful. Anything about your other kids? Sarah, um, all my children have two children, uh, so I have eight grandchildren. Uh, Sarah did an undergraduate physics degree at Stanford, and then joined the Woods Hole uh, MIT program. And sh she went down in Alvin. And I tease her. She now lives in Wellesley. I tease her, when you were in Perth on a postdoc, mm -hmm. I could go see the world. Mm -hmm. But you're in Wellesley. <laughs> I've seen Wellesley. Yeah. But anyway, she's fine, and she uh, works on environmental issues. Uh, and Tom is the non-MIT in the crowd. Um, he went to RPI. He's tremendous energy. He formed a company. Um, he was uh, active in the management of the company and sold the company mm -hmm. and is back at, at BU um, where he is in the computer engineering department. He writes papers. Mm -hmm. He has one <coughs> uh, w which has uh, quotes in his own paper next to my Little's Law paper. <laughs> um, uh, and then Rule, uh, the youngest, is a solar engineer. He has an um, undergraduate degree from Johns Hopkins and a master's degree from MIT in the, um, I don't know, the um, uh, Uh, it's an uh, 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 it's the it's the solar engineering crowd mm -hmm. uh, is where he has it, and he and he he, he was in a startup, and um, and they had a lot of good business. Um, they probably still do. Um, 
um, off the grid in California see, yeah. where they grow marijuana. <laughs> yeah, right. Anyway, so that's my crowd. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think, you know, to sort of wrap things up, and I don't know whether, how to, um, you know, sort of do the, you know, how would you like to be remembered? <laughs> uh, or you want me to start over? <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> No, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you. <laughs> I have to be remembered for a little slow. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Which I should do a better job of explaining. Um, and the other thing is uh, that I, I think the being in on the early years of marketing science is a, a satisfaction. Yeah. There's an article in, in I, the Sloan Magazine, or sort of at, at in the early '80s, that highlighted um, MDA management decisions. Systems. Oh yes, the, yes, yes, yes. Had the picture on the of our, all the MIT that's right grads on this on the stairway and and so on. I think um, um, MDS is some, certainly something that that um, I know I want to be remembered. For and I yeah. think uh, uh, oh, no 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 uh, I considered you to be a, 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 a real role model and you know sometimes I wonder you know if I had ever got gotten a PhD would that have set me off in just some completely different. <laughs> Different, different path, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm so glad that we, you know, had the opportunity to work together at MDS, and that I was really focused on kind of the working with companies, and that we were always working with companies to to come up with ideas. That um, well, you're still doing it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> And that's good. Yeah. But, um, well, I'm not finished yet. No, no, <laughs> me either. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, I guess that, that wraps up uh, at least this segment of uh, yeah. John Little's history and yeah. operations I've, research. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. Thanks.